Our main theme this morning is about hope. We are talking about that and using the word anchor to connect to it. I found three words associated with hope, and this lesson is about one of those, and that word is the word anchor. There's something interesting in the book of Hebrews, and if you've never connected it, I want to do that this morning with you. It has to do with something in chapter 2 and verse 1. In chapter 2 and verse 1, there is a statement there about our drifting. That if we're not careful, we may drift away from it. We may drift away from the truth. And then when you get to chapter 6, you're going to find a statement there about us having an anchor of the soul. And so if you've never connected those two thoughts from chapter 2 to chapter 6, I want to do that in lesson form this morning. We're going to find out what causes us to drift. We're going to find out how we get anchored. And then we're going to endeavor to do that. And we're going to do that by studying a little bit about the book. And then we're going to study a little bit about the chapter, chapter 6. And then we're going to end up by studying about the verse, chapter 6, verse 19. And so let's go find our anchor in the book of Hebrews. We begin with the word itself. The word anchor is used four times in Scripture. Three of those are in Acts chapter 27. And they have to do with a literal anchor. And the word happens to be plural each time it's used in Acts chapter 27. So it's anchors, plural, and they are literal anchors to a literal boat. And so those are the first uses. Then we have this one in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 19, and it's very different. It's a spiritual application. It's singular in form. There is one anchor of the soul, and unless we find it, we'll be in danger of drifting. In chapter 2 and verse 1, for this reason we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. The it in chapter 2 and verse 1 is the message we've learned about Christ. It's about scripture. It's about what we've heard that brought us to Christ in the first place. We need to be careful. We, we need to pay very close attention to all those things that we've heard so that we do not drift away from it. And so it is our hope. It's our anchor. And it is tied to the message in Scripture. And it's important that we give good attention to that. Hebrews begins with the importance of the message itself delivered in Christ. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, we are having described for us there the great shipwreck of judgment that waits for those who drift from its teaching and its truth. And the writer goes on to talk about the special role of mankind and how Christ entered into the form of man to come to this earth to usher in the great salvation that we enjoy. That's in Hebrews 2, verses 5 through verse 18, the end of that chapter. Ultimately, he becomes our great high priest, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. The danger of drifting in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1 has a number of other forms as you move through the book of Hebrews. That is, it's described in different ways. We have the description of drifting. And of course, you think about a boat, and it's just out there in the water, and there's nothing tethering it to anything else, and there it goes drifting along. Maybe you've been out somewhere on one of those little blow-up rafts that you can get on and you shut your eyes and you're out there enjoying the sunshine and you look up and unless you're in an enclosed pool, maybe you've drifted off a lot further than you thought you were from the shore. So you have this idea of drifting in chapter 2 and verse 1, but that takes on other explanations so we understand what he's talking about. In chapter 3, verses 7 through 11, you have Old Testament Israel. Go back to the Old Testament pages where they were hardened 
in their hearts, and they went astray in their hearts, and so they could not enter the rest of Canaan land. That's drifting in another form. The hardened heart and going astray, you're drifting. In Hebrews 3, verses 12 through 14, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. So drifting can be hardened in the heart, going astray in the heart, having an unbelieving heart, falling away from the living God. Continue the reading in verse 13 of chapter 3. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it's called today. You have an emphasis about time, about opportunity with each other, that we're going to keep on encouraging each other. This is part of our tethering. It's part of our anchoring system, that we're involved with each other, and day by day, day after day, continually, while it's called today, while we have opportunity, while we're alive, in the presence of one another, in contact with each other, that we are being careful to encourage each other so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. That's what we've heard. We've heard some things. They caused us to be convicted in heart to be convicted in mind, to find out what we needed to do to be right with our God. We need to be careful to keep giving good attention to those things, reminding each other, encouraging each other, so that we don't become hardened in heart. Life is hard. Things happen. Circumstances change. Our mood changes. Our emotions change. Our health changes. And in all of those things, we can be hardened in heart. We can become callous. We can start to fall away. We can accommodate the circumstances around us in a way that moves away from God. So we encourage each other day by day, while it's still called today, so that we don't end up like Old Testament Israel did and drift away in that way. Holding fast begins to develop our anchor. And it's tied to the message that we've heard about our Lord. Our rest is not like their rest. Hebrews chapter 4 focuses on that. They were moving toward Canaan land. A whole generation of that people did not get to go into Canaan land because they drifted away, because they became hardened and unbelieving in heart. And they went astray. They started to follow the culture of the land they were in in Canaan, and they went away from God. But Canaan was their rest. And in Hebrews 4, our rest is not Canaan land. Our rest is heaven itself. And so we want to move toward that. Hebrews chapter 5 begins to develop more of the high priesthood of Christ through the image of Melchizedek. We don't have time to go back and talk about Melchizedek. You'll find him in the book of Genesis. This is when... Abraham went to rescue his nephew Lot, who had been taken captive in a war, and he brings him back, and in the process he meets a man by the name of Melchizedek. So I would encourage you to go back and read about him in the book of Genesis. But Jesus is called a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. It's very different from the priesthood of Levi in the Old Testament. And it's about understanding Jesus, how he functions as a high priest. Not in Jerusalem, not at the temple, but in heaven itself before the Father in heaven. How he intercedes with his blood. What's at stake in that? And it all depends on our understanding of the message. So Hebrews 5 verse 11, as you get toward the end of that chapter, concerning him we have much to say and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. They were beginning to drift because their ears were becoming dull to the message. They couldn't dig in to Bible. They couldn't dig into Scripture. They had to be retaught, and chapter 6 opens up this way. They had to be retaught the elementary things over and over and over. What first brought you to Christ? 
What convinced you to be baptized for the remission of your sins? Well, let's hear about repentance again. Let's hear about baptism again. They had become so dull of hearing, they had to continually rehearse the elementary principles of the faith. But they couldn't dig into the deeper things because they'd become dull of hearing, didn't want to spend the time and the energy to even open their Bible, as it were, for us today. They didn't have a full Bible, but they had Old Testament. But it'd be like us not even wanting, I don't even want to open my Bible. I don't want to spend time in it. I don't want to focus that hard. I don't, I don't want to get a headache studying. So let's just rehearse the elementary things over and over. They were beginning the drifting process at the end of chapter 5. And the author was afraid he couldn't talk to them about the deeper things they needed because they didn't even remember the first things they were taught. Well, that's a little bit about the book leading up to chapter 6. Now let's talk about the chapter itself. Hebrews 6, verses 1 through 6, is beginning with the danger of those who fall away from the faith. Romans 10, 17, faith comes how? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ or the word about Christ. Faith comes by hearing the Word. Faith comes by hearing Scripture, listening to it, reading it, meditating upon it. That's how our faith is developed. Our faith is, is developed through reading about the faith in Scripture. This is the danger of those who fall away from that. They've heard it. They've obeyed it once. They've adhered to it once. But then they begin to drift away. And remaining, remaining faithful is going to require moving forward in our Bible understanding. First three verses of chapter 6, needing to be reminded of the elementary things all over again. Those who stagnate in their Bible learning, those who stop the process after conversion, they're in danger of drifting away. We need to attend to our anchor. An anchor needs to be attached to something. If you have a boat, if you have a ship, the anchor's attached to the ship. That's you. That's me. That anchor goes somewhere. It attaches to something and holds you in that place. Our anchor goes beyond the veil into the heavenly realm where Jesus is. We need to attend to our anchor, and one of the ways we do that is our attention to Bible. When's the last time you learned something new in the Bible? How is your regular study habit? How many times a week do you set aside on purpose to read, study, learn, and grow in the Bible? How many passages have you committed to memory over the years of your life? Do you study the Bible once a week, twice a week, once a day, once a month, only when I attend the services of God's people, and sometimes then my mind wanders away? What kind of attention are we giving to our anchor? Because it's tied to the message. That's the beginning part of this lesson. Hebrews 6, 9 through 12, the author turns to a better direction for his readers. He tells them the danger of those who are falling away. Those, it's impossible to renew them again because they've wandered so far away. They knew it, they embraced it, they threw it away, and that's their mindset they're maintaining. I'm, I'm, now I'm throwing that away. It's not that important to me. Used to be, not anymore. That's my mindset. That's all I care about it. Impossible to renew them to repentance as long as they have that frame of mind. But, verse 9, Beloved, we're convinced of better things concerning you, things that accompany salvation, though we're speaking this way. For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and labor of love which you've shown toward his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. Be sure you get this first part. 
Why is the author convinced that his readers are not going the direction of those that are impossible to renew to repentance? Why is he convinced that they're not going to drift away? It's because of their involvement with God's people. Because of their participation and involvement in the church that belongs to Christ. They, they have ministered and are still ministering to the saints. If we are not ministering to the saints, if we're not a part of that activity, that's a sign that we're beginning to drift. There's a great danger there. Verse 11. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through, who through faith and patience inherit the promises. The word hope is going to be used three times in this chapter. This is the first time the word hope is used. And we are to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. The word end there is a very special term. Sometimes we think about the word end differently. This is a word that means we are maturing in something. We are growing in something. There is a goal. There is a destination involved. We are to realize the full assurance of hope all the way to the end product of what it's about. And that has to do with the salvation of our soul. Their activity, their care for each other in the church is why the author is convinced that they're going to have a better outcome than those who drifted away and are impossible to renew to repentance again. That's evidence, their involvement in the Lord's church. It's evidence of their desire, proof that their confession of Christ is making a difference in their life. It's their connection to the church. And then there's a reminder to reconnect with the message itself. We can't just focus on fellowship or benevolence or social aspects of the church. We have to be connected to the message in ever-deepening ways. The power is in the Word of God, not in man. We can't just work on one side of that, what we do with each other, activities, and not be connected to the message. They go hand in hand. Our connection to the message will cause us to weave into each other's lives in profitable ways. The one is the evidence of the other, and we need to keep those things together. The writer gives them then the example of Old Testament Abraham from the book of Genesis in chapter, in chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. Abraham's a good example of how not to drift away, how to be anchored to the Word of God, and how to follow that through to its desired end. Verses 13 through 15, For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and will surely multiply you. And so having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. Abraham was anchored. God gave him a promise. Abraham patiently waited through all of that process of the years of his life until he obtained what God had promised, until he obtained what was in the Word of God. Abraham shows us a life that did that. His patient waiting goes all the way from Genesis chapter 12 all the way to Genesis chapter one, 21 when his son Isaac is born. And then it goes beyond that to how his descendants develop as the nation of Israel and even beyond that to their inheritance of the land of Canaan and beyond that to Galatians 3.16 to his seed, his great descendants, which is Christ. So Abraham was anchored to that. He was sure of it and he was steadfast in the things that he did to be sure to obtain it. That application of Abraham is for us. Chapter 6, beginning in verse 16. For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath is given, 
as a confirmation and it's an end in every dispute. So the illustration there for us to understand it would be like going into a courtroom. And there's your hand on the Bible and your other hand raised up. And you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. God did that with Abraham. He had no one greater to swear by than himself. So he made Abraham a promise. And then God put himself under oath by himself. So that by those two things, he gave great assurance. In the same way, verse 17, God desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. Second use of the word hope. The promise, the oath that God gave to Abraham is about we who have taken refuge and have strong encouragement and take hold of the hope set before us. What he promised Abraham involves us in Christ today. We are still anchored to the same promise that he gave to Abraham. Romans 15 verse 4. Whatever was promised in earlier times was written for our instruction so that we through perseverance and the encouragement of scriptures might have hope. So we're to realize chapter 6 verse 11 to grow in, to mature, to reach toward the destination of that hope designed toward salvation. Chapter 6 verse 18 to take hold of it to put it under arrest, to have it in our custody like Abraham as we meet the challenges of our life in growing faith. So that as we encounter things throughout life, things that could move us this way or that, we refuse to be moved. We remember the promise of God. We remember the word of God. We dig in deeply into it. And we maintain an answer to the obstacles of life that show we are moving toward the end of that great hope in salvation. We come down to our verse itself, chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. This hope, third use of the word hope, this hope we have is an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So that anchor goes all the way back to the drifting problem of chapter 2, verse 1. We need to give great heed to what we've heard so that we do not drift from it. How do we do that? It has to do with our anchor that we find in chapter 6 and verse 19. It requires not wandering away from the message of Scripture. The anchor is about being connected to the high priestly activity of Jesus in heaven itself. The anchor goes into that holy of holies where God himself resides. It's evidenced our anchor and that it is sure and steadfast. It is evidenced in our involvement in his church. All of those things help us to understand that we have a hold of our anchor. And it's tethered on both sides the way that it should be. Is your soul anchored in God's unchanging word or does it move with the currents that flow through life? You run into this, you run into that. You run into a relationship problem, you run into a financial problem, you, you run into a, to a work problem, a neighborhood problem, whatever it might be, then does your anchor slip out of your hand? Do you forget about the teaching of the Word of God and do it your own way? These are all signs of drifting. The hope that is the anchor of the soul is active in serving the saints, chapter 6, verse 10. It has learned the beginning things that lead us to Christ, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. It finds strength 
in the continual study of God's Word and the changes that it demands in our lives. It has confidence in what Jesus does with His blood on our behalf in the Holy of Holies of Heaven itself. Everyone needs hope. Without it, we are hopeless and we begin to drift wherever life wants to take us. Everyone needs hope and it can be yours today. Let me suggest this. It's going to begin in the study of God's Word. Step number two, you'll begin to make some changes in obedience to the things that you study about, the things that you learn. Then number three, you're going to begin to be a part of God's church and serve and minister to fellow Christians. There is a study process that's going to bring you into Christ. Your life's going to begin to change and it's going to involve all these people it's going to involve activity where we remind each other day by day and encourage one another. I don't know where you're at with hope today. There can be people in the presence of the assembly Sunday after Sunday after Sunday who've lost their hope. They're already in the drifting mode, have been for a long time. You can't see it on their face. They won't tell you about it. They don't want to talk about it. But people know when they're drifting. They've lost the hope. And even the assemblies of God's people feel rather empty to them. Day by day, we encourage each other one reason that we're here. We worship our God together. We remember his sacrifice for us in the Lord's Supper. And we sing and we pray and we teach God's word to encourage each other day by day. And it's still called today. This is the great day, the day that the Lord has made for salvation. And so behind the face, you may be someone without hope. And life is just shattering before your eyes. It's going all sorts of directions. You're not where you want to be, not even where you used to be. This is a time to renew that commitment in Christ. Or if you're not in Christ yet, or wonder even what that means, to ask for someone to study the Word of God with you and help you to find the beginning place. We would love to help you today. We take time out in every assembly to offer an invitation for just that reason. We don't want you to go home without hope. We want to begin to help you to find that anchor in Christ. When we stand to sing this next song, we call it an invitation song. It is your invitation. And if you'll come down to the front of the auditorium, I'll be here, elders will be here, we want to hear what your spiritual need is. We want to assist you in any way that we can. And that may involve some things that go beyond this day and enter into this week and the weeks after where we come personally and help you in Bible study. We may begin praying for you and encouraging you. And you may find some friendships here that you didn't know you had. And you'll go home with a sense of hope. If we can help you, please come forward while we stand and sing.